Welcome to On Cloud, the podcast for cloud professionals, where we break down the state of cloud computing today and how you can unleash the power of cloud for your enterprise. Now, here's your host, David Linthicum. Welcome back to the On Cloud Podcast. Today on the show, I'm joined by Jay McDonald and Michael Allen. Jay is a managing director and co-chair for Modern Delivery at Deloitte, and Michael is Dynatrace's worldwide VP of Alliances and Partners. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Hey, good morning, David. So, Michael, I'm going to go to you first to kind of get your story in terms of how you came to Dynatrace. And so catch us up with you know how you got into this particular area of the market. Have you always been uh, working with product companies? You know, What's your history? Yeah, I, I, I started off in actually in the networking space, kind of in um, leadership positions there. And I, I moved actually to Dynatrace uh, 24 years ago, started off in EMEA, uh, European leadership positions. And for the last five years, I've been running the partner business worldwide prior to that, running the European partner sales organization. Wow. And so, Jay, you and I both work for Deloitte, but I'd love to hear your story, how you came to Deloitte and what you've been focusing on for the last five, 10 years. Yeah, uh, well, been in IT for 24 years and came to Deloitte uh, about four years ago, coming up on that anniversary. And, you know, I've been in the cloud since 2010, so kind of an early doctor, kind of go back in time. I cut my teeth in packet sniffing technology. I was a firewall developer and spent a, a wild ride from, you know, doing operations and into architecture. Here at Deloitte, I lead the cloud engineering practice, what we call modern delivery. And that includes DevOps, Agile, site reliability engineering, cloud native development, and of of course, observability. So let's kind of set the stage. And Michael, I'm going to go to you first. So we have the changing dynamic of IT. We're moving into complex distributed architectures, the way I like to look at it. So it's hybrid and multi-cloud. We're dealing with the growth of heterogeneity. We're dealing with the growth of multiple services. You know, we may have had 1,000 cloud services under management, you know, five years ago. Now we have 10,000 cloud services under management. And by the way, we need to put our existing legacy systems underneath this umbrella because those are aging and those need to be managed and operated in some way, shape, or form, as well as edge computing and IoT. So we're moving to this dynamic where things are getting harder and harder to operate. So we're trying to weaponize technologies and tools and approaches to make this happen. And so we have, you know, AI ops, and we have the, the rising science of observability, and we're going to discuss that. So how do you think we're dealing with the market these days? And what do you see as uh, being in the market that's impacting the way in which we're operating these various enterprise systems? Yeah, I think I think you said it perfectly that the, the apps are being refactored into hundreds and thousands of moving pieces being hosted inside these containers where those container platforms and the workloads are kind of moving and resizing automatically. And then you've got the velocity of the kind of release cycles of these apps and services gone from months and weeks to releases in some organizations every day. And, you know, that it's, it's a connected ecosystem of apps that are, you know, running across these multi-clouds. And I think the challenge is, right, user expectations as well, is everyone expects nothing less than always on. And the challenge I think with basic observability, to your point that a lot of organizations are struggling with, is, you know, they're just taking logs, traces, events, and metrics coming from a myriad of disconnected kind of sources, putting them in a database, and and then really relying either on data on glass and humans to be the intelligence layer, or, you know, very rudimentary AI ops systems that, you know, just, you know are trying to cut, handle this sort of data overload, but they're basically no better than time-based correlation engines and and they really don't work at scale they lack context they lack dependencies and that really causes a problem because ultimately where people want to go with observability is they want to they want to automate off it they want to self-heal but you can't self-heal on false conclusions and that's that's the real challenge today i think yeah and go to you jay so in other words we, we've had self-healing we had the ability to do monitoring and management make kicked off some events observability kind of takes insight into the next level. And so we're able to kick off actions based on insights. I don't think that we had available five years ago. So how do you see the market evolving? And what do you think they're the big drivers right now that's moving people to observability tools, AI ops, things like that? Yeah, I think Michael set the foundation brilliantly. I mean, you know, the volume of data, the variety, the velocity of data is really becoming too large for humans to really analyze. And so we need a better solution. 
And so I see the, the emergence of AI and ML becoming really part and parcel to our, our the next generation of our you know observability capabilities. And I think that's what we need to really start to harness because you know the complexity, as you mentioned earlier, is only increasing. Distributed applications are, you know, becoming the norm and humans are just not, you know, designed to, you know, excuse my technical term, but grip manually all these logs. We need a, a better way. And so AI and ML helps us automate that. But also what Michael mentioned is really contextualize it. And I think that's a huge opportunity is to contextual data, tying metrics, logging and traces to business outcomes. So, Michael, we're hearing this topic a lot. Observability is related to operations, which you primarily focus on, I believe, and also security and, uh, you know, even database administration, things like that. So why are we focusing on, I think Jay just summar- sum- summarized it very well, we're not looking at tactical data anymore. We're not just looking at raw data logs to make decisions as to, you know, what we should do to tweak systems, better performance, auto-tuning, the ability to sell feel, things like that. But uh, observability really takes our insights to the next level. As you say, it, instead of just looking at data in, in glass, we're getting the ability to get down to a single source of truth for what actually is going on holistically within the systems and how to act upon it. So what other trends are you seeing in the market? And is this something that actually is taking off within the enterprises? Do they understand what observability is? And that's a great question because I, I often get asked the question is, is isn't observability just just monitoring? You know, and, and and I think monitoring is something that worked fairly well in a time where the systems were fairly static, you know, kind of putting data onto dashboards and and the humans looking at the at the dashes and then obviously re- reacting and responding to that observability is is especially when you couple it with AI AI ops and kind of build that in it, it, it can kind of deal with the complexity of, of of the modern cloud and the velocity and the dynamics of the modern modern cloud to try and not only detect issues but also potentially predict them if we've got a world where user expectations is that everything has to be always on. We, we need observability to go beyond just providing answers, but also to do autonomous cloud, to do self-healing. I would say in conclusion, it's, it's no longer a bolt-on, an afterthought, oh, we need to monitor this, but it needs to be built in if it's going to deal with this hyper-dynamic apps and infrastructure. And that's where I see a big trend of my customers going to observability as code. So, Jay, Michael just talked about how his customers are looking at observability, and I, I suspect they would. You know, they're, they're looking at observability tools, AI ops, the ability to have AI-powered insights into these various systems. What do you see holistically as the role of observability within the enterprises? How are they How are they taking it off, generally speaking, not around a particular technology, but do they understand it? They understand that they're building into the planning and operations thing, or is this something that we need to teach them? Yeah, I, I think you, you're, you're striking at the heart of what – we're trying to educate our customers on is that observability is no longer a bolt-on. It's not something you think about after you architect your your products, your applications. You really need to be doing it in upfront in the architecture, and it should be right in the bullseye of all the other parts of your um, your, your software delivery lifecycle. So we think about it in the context of, of using DevOps leading practices around you know setting up your pipelines, you're building automation, and you should be instrumenting observability into that pipeline. You know early into the code. I think you know Mike just mentioned observability as code you know one of the one of the newest kind of capabilities out there is monitoring as code or monaco for short and i think a lot of people are latching on to this you know we're doing it with open telemetry we're doing it with dynatrace we're doing it with you know some of these like you know great products in the market that enable us to get that telemetry much earlier so you know this gets into like operating model and like teams like who's using it whether that's site reliability engineers or DevOps, you know, engineers, I think it really becomes a tool that everyone can use, including developers, including executives, because the data, you know, it, it can be captured early on and prevent those issues, you know, upstream down the line before they happen. Absolutely. So, Michael, in my illustrious career, we've always been talking about dealing with operations at different levels of sophistication. We didn't really make much of a move, but what I noticed that over the years is that we focused on infrastructure. So in other words, I'm going to focus on compute. I'm going to focus on storage. 
and not really where the rubber meets the road in terms of the value that IT, IT compute and storage brings, and that's the applications. The ability to have visibility into these things that actually drive my business is probably as important, if more important, than really just kind of monitoring the infrastructure around it. So I see lots of observability systems that are moving into application level operations and monitoring and self-healing, which is a good thing to do. Explain what that is and why do enterprises need to consider that as kind of taking their their cloud ops to the next level? Well, Dynatrace, what we refer to that as is, is full stack visibility, the, the ability to be able to have the context of dependencies, both right from the infrastructure and the you know, infrastructure as a service up up to the you know to the applications, the Java .NET, the you know the sort of code level tier into the services to the applications. So that's kind of what we sort of from I/O and infra all the way up to the to the application, and then be able to look at that all the way from you know kind of horizontally from user across the internet and through the various cloud instances. So that kind of user through data center view. And so you've got kind of that east to west and north to south kind of view because, you know, the apps being deployed intrinsically today, you know, like operations as code with the infrastructure and the infrastructure is highly dynamic and the applications are under highly dynamic workloads. And that's really where to be able to spot problems really needs that full stack visibility. And if you try and do it with two separate tool sets, which is not running with the same context, it makes it very, very difficult for an AI engine to actually come to you know, deterministic answers that can be automated upon. Same is true as well when you think about automating the DevOps pipelines, right? It's, 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 it's not only being able to do autonomous operations, but it's also being able to automate the DevOps pipelines and, and to speed up innovation, to speed up higher quality apps that move into production. And, and, and the other piece, I think, which is really important, we've touched on it briefly here, is observability is so adjacent, if not to the security market. So we should not only be observing from performance and availability full stack, but also security for vulnerabilities and to protect the application. And that's kind of also that built in versus bolt on. So, Michael, I'm going to go back to you with a follow on question. because You just said something very profound that I see emerging in the market. And that's the ability to kind of link these tool sets and link these capabilities together, either within the same product brand name, but the security should depend on operations and operations that depend on security. The reality is that many instances, breaches that are occurring are going to lead to processor saturation, Mm -hmm. ransomware attacks that take over storage systems. They're going to be indicated from operational indicators, the ability to leverage observability to see the current state and how we're kind of taking what's occurring in the current states and our ability to diagnose an issue and then take care of the issue using automation. So how are we thinking about this? Is this something where we're pushing two products together, two concepts together? Is this something that's basically merging into a single concept of observability, but moving it into holistic observability? Yeah, for me, it's moving into a into a single observability source of data that both looks at the data and the metrics and the health as well as the security from with a single you know with a single agent or a single source of data and to be able to do that it's moving beyond kind of the old world of security which was kind of like protect and perimeter it's really very very difficult to do in a modern cloud where you've got its hybrid components are running many places the you know the velocity of development you know things are being deployed all the time so you need something which is deployed with the app to see where where the vulnerabilities actually are, and then to you know help organisations know is that is that particular component actually vulnerable externally, or is it is you know what, what sort of prioritise the the vulnerability assessments as well. So Jay, same question to you, but you know what are you seeing more holistically? In other words, across the enterprises that are looking at AI ops, cloud ops, the ability to deal with complexity using automation and the ability to have observability to kind of take a lot of the insights to the next level so we can take actions to, you know, build a better infrastructure and operate a better infrastructure. Are we seeing the convergence of operational observability and security observability, or is this something that's just basically merging into one concept? You know, I think we are. I see a collision course happening, particularly in the logging realm. You know, when you think about structured logs, you know, those typically come from, you know, migrated systems, they're being emitted, 
and whether that's user queries or debugging logs or security logs, there's really no sense in having these separate. So it makes more sense to kind of aggregate these and put more you know, contextual understanding around them. And so I, I do see a collision course or a convergence happening in the security realm. But that being said, I'll caveat that there's still some separation with the security information and event management systems. So I think we're on our way. It's a journey. Uh, but, you know, today where we're at is I definitely think we have the ability to take logging metrics and traces and put them into one, you know, beautiful database where we can visualize what's going on. And so, yes, we are on a path of conversion, but there are some exceptions to that where security has so many dimensions and layers to it. So, Jay, back to you, Michael brought up the concept of DevOps, the ability to kind of build observability and operational dynamics, you know, into the application tool chain. So we're doing some testing in terms of how best it's going to be to operate the systems. And, you know, if you look at DevOps, it's kind of emerged in some pretty cool ways. Not only do we do security testing, but we actually test for sustainability operations to make sure the code's written in uh, with sustainability in mind. So it's using less power. Are we moving to where we're going to be more operationally aware and we're building observability systems, maybe uh, even observability as code, you know, into the core applications? And are the DevOps tool chains and the developers in general moving in this direction? Sorry for the complex question. What do you think? I do think DevSecOps plays, you know, a massive role here. You know, when we think about, you know, the pipelines that we're building, what we're really doing is we're setting up quality gates right along the path and we're setting up thresholds. And so the only way to know if we're breaching these thresholds is to instrument it and have telemetry. So observability plays a, a huge role, and particularly around compliance and, and policy. You know, when you're, when you're codifying these and you're putting them as, let's say, templates, and you're instrumenting them into your pipeline, you want to know if you're in compliance way before you get to production, you know, earlier in your you know, user acceptance testing or in your development stages. <laughs> And so, you know, this is when you establish your, you know, your error budgets and your SLIs and SLOs, and you really want to understand it end to end. So I think security plays a, a massive role in, in observability into the DevSecOps capability. And those pipelines are truly why developers, DevOps engineers, SRE all need to work together comprehensively so that they understand what are the, the thresholds that we can tolerate along that system, what are the parameters that we can work within without, you know, breaking, you know, putting us in a vulnerable position once we release it to production. So, Michael, I go to, you know, speak at a lot of DevOps conferences and always talk about the ability to build things in the DevOps tool chain and how we build, assemble, and deploy code that are going to provide better operations after deployment. Observability is code. We just talked about that. But you know, what kind of things do you see augmenting in the typical way that we do development in our ability to get to systems that are more observable in nature and our ability to get to systems that are much more reliable? Yeah, and I think a lot of that ties back to what we were saying earlier about it being built in. And to, to do that, it requires observability that A, deploys with the app. So it means it kind of auto-deploys. It auto-discovers what's, what it's been deployed with. It kind of auto-instruments. What it's uh, what it's discovered, it auto baselines because you know specifically with the cloud, you know the old way of doing predictions and capacity planning, you know where you've effectively got you know unlimited capacity to a certain extent, the baselining has to change, and then it's kind of auto detection on that baselining with automatic root cause analysis, and you know if I relate to one of one of my largest customers who really runs observability as code for one reason because of the scale of the environment but the other reason because they don't want humans touching and following a dynamic what is a very huge 50,000 you know machine plus kubernetes environment because humans will make errors and and they've achieved something really really tremendous they in the last 2 years they've doubled the number of customers their transaction volume has gone up by 480% and they've gone from around 60 hours of downtime to zero hours of downtime in the last year. And whilst the platform and the number of customers has more than doubled in size, their observability team is the same size. And that, so it's really allowing their business to scale, but keep their operational costs under, under tremendous control. 
So, Jay, you mentioned something that kind of intrigued me. And the thing is, as somebody who's been a developer for many years before I started doing what I'm doing now, having to build many versions of the same application to deal with compliance based on the localization, internationalization of systems in particular countries and jurisdictions and legal issues, things like that. So in other words, we have these applications that have to maintain compliance. The old way of doing it would be just to have a one-off version that's that's really kind of customized for a particular country. But you mentioned something, policies as code, governance as code, compliance as code, the ability to kind of do this in a much more dynamic way that that really kind of hit me that really should make more sense, save a lot of money and make this stuff less complex. Tell us about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, you think about the planning stages of your, your application. I mean, most of our clients are distributed globally. And so these applications need to scale in various jurisdictions with different regulations, different data privacy and sovereignty issues. So, you know, this gets highly complex. And the only way to really handle that is create these policies in code and templatize them. So that, you know, when you are launching and deploying your application into these regions around the world, these governance policies are already set up and they're already set to the thresholds to that jurisdiction. And this has to happen all the way in the planning process, all the way in the ALM tools, right? Your application lifecycle management. And you really need to think it all the way through to your ITSM tools. And we think about this flow end to end. And when I say ITSM, I'm thinking, you know, your ticketing systems, because all these things need to be built in, not only into the observability, but into those tools as well, so that you have a full and complete picture. Because let's just face it, you know, these are, these are dynamic environments. The regulations are, are changing dramatically. And so in order to keep pace with that, we need to have, you know, an understanding of like, what, how are we performing in each of these environments? And the observability tool lets us know, hey, you know, we're breaching this compliance or we're breaching this threshold. And so this is where I think the two really come together in a fascinating way and making our lives much better and much easier than it was prior doing this manually with data centers and, you know, the legacy world that we used to, where we all come from. So, Michael, let's say we hop in a time machine or we're doing this podcast in five years. What do you think we're going to be talking about as related to observability cloud ops? It's kind of taking everything to the next level. Yeah, indeed. I, th- I think, you know, one of the one of the things when we transform the way that we build our software, we, we transform from two major releases of our platform a year to now doing a major release to our, you know, near 4,000 uh, customers every two weeks. And so that's the you know, major release of our platform. And, you know, of, of all of our customers, 90, nearly 95% of those customers are on a release of Dynatrace less than 45 days old. When we transformed, the, you know, really transformed ourselves to be a, the way we deliver software, a DevOps organization, we've actually gone that one step further to no ops. So basically operating fully autonomously from and, and actually not having any operation staff, just having a, a relatively small SRE team that, that builds self-healing into our platform. And I think that's five years from now. I think a lot of organizations are going to be talking about you know, transforming the way that we operate software to be one of the no-op style. And, you know, it, it, same, same on SecOps to move to, you know, to, to no, no security operations and, and have that fully automated as, as much as possible as well. Yeah, I think that human participation is going to be diminished over time in operations. We're going to automate pretty much everything. And, and that's a good thing. Ultimately, it's the ability to react to something, you know, when it occurs and the ability to kind of take an orderly approach to self-healing, you know, correcting security breaches, things like that. So, Jay, where can the listeners find your work on the web? Well, you know, we're pretty easy to find. If you go and search in Ops for Deloitte, you know, you should see our, our landing page pop up. Um, we'll have a framework there where we have some opinionated frameworks and architectures that we talk about. Uh, one of them is called PACE, which is really the, the process, architecture, culture, engineering, mashup, and all the things you need to do around those dimensions in order, in order to be successful. Um, so, yeah, you can just go it and it should pop right up. So, Michael, same question. Well, Dynatrace is all about, you know, we're in the business of helping customers run modern clouds and and run modern clouds right. Simplifying that complexity, faster innovation, more efficiently, more secure with AI built in, really to enable that automation. And you can find more 
about all of that at dynatrace.com. This is a very important topic. If you've been reading my stuff on InfoWorld and even stuff we've been talking on the podcast, the ability to do battle with complexity that's pr- pushing up is the single most limiting factor that's going to stop people from being successful with digital enablement and cloud enablement, you know, all these things that are occurring. We're just building best of breed systems, and that's going to generate complexity, and we have to have some way to manage complexity. And that's going to be the ability to leverage the the concept of observability and then the implementation of how you do it with AI ops and put this in a in a pattern where it's controlling things from development to deployment and how we're operating these systems. I can't stress this enough. We got to get this stuff right. So if you're not focusing on this, you know, as an enterprise IT professional, this should be something that's on your short list right now. So if you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to like us, rate us and subscribe. You can also check out our past episodes, including those hosted by my good friend, Mike Cavus. Find out more at DeloitteCloudPodcast.com, all one word. If you'd like to contact me directly, you can email me at dlinticum, L-I-N-T-H-I-C-U-M at Deloitte.com. So until next time, best of luck with your cloud journey. Everybody stay safe. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening to On Cloud for Cloud Professionals with David Linthicum. Connect with David on Twitter and LinkedIn and visit the Deloitte on Cloud blog at Deloitte.com forward slash US forward slash Deloitte dash on dash cloud dash blog. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app. This podcast is produced by Deloitte. The views and opinions expressed by podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Deloitte. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice or services of any kind. For additional information about Deloitte, go to Deloitte.com forward slash about.